Okay, so, so on with today's lecture. Uh, it's a real honor to have Mike Weissman here to tell us about quantum mechanics. Um, Mike's educational background includes Harvard University and University of California at San Diego. Uh, he came here to the University of Illinois in 1978 and since then has led a, a very cutting edge program in research into uh, condensed matter physics and in particular uh, interesting aspects of ferromagnetic systems and, and, and uh, measurements and, and uh, noise in these systems. Uh, and a lot of this stuff is intricately coupled to the details of quantum mechanics, which is what we're going to tell, he's going to tell us about today. Uh, Mike's also a very gifted teacher and also a very fascinating person to talk to because not only does he think a lot and, and, and understand quantum mechanics a lot more than most of us, um, but he also has thought a lot and actually teaches a course that deals with some of the philosophy associated with quantum mechanics and it's, uh, some of the interesting uh, implications from this science. So it's a real honor to have him here today. Please join me welcome Professor Mike Weissman. Uh, so, despite the fact that this is supposed to be all cutting edge and everything, I'm going to use really retro technology here, uh, pieces of plastic with a light bulb. Uh, Kevin wasn't kidding about Inga being the uh, brains behind this. For example, she was smart enough to put on my door a couple weeks ago uh, an announcement of this so that I remember every day that, you know, Saturday I was supposed to go someplace different than usual. Um, Okay, uh, I'm, this is going to be, like I say, real low-tech, real conversational, and um, I'm going to try to avoid any sort of gee whiz stuff, but actually have one or two logical points that I'm going to try and go slowly enough that everybody can get. Perhaps the key point to doing that is for everybody to feel free to interrupt, ask questions, uh, don't worry about or, or, or just say that what I'm saying sounds like nonsense. Whatever, whatever uh, comes to mind, I, I know that it's hard to do that in a big group, so some of you who are a little more aggressive or something, just take the responsibility and please do that. So uh, just a little bit of, of background about uh, the his history of quantum mechanics. We often teach courses where quantum mechanics is called is thrown into the category of modern science, but if you really think about the history of it, uh, it's not so modern anymore. Uh, in 1900, Lord Kelvin gave a speech in which he said, well, physics is all settled, uh, all the basics. There's just two little dark clouds on the horizon. One of the dark clouds was that it was impossible to measure how fast we were moving through the ether. That was the Michelson-Morley experiment. Of course, that led to special relativity and ultimately general relativity. Uh, the other dark cloud was that, uh, a little bit strange, it, there's a, something called the black body radiation problem where if you followed the logical implications of classical physics strictly, you would say that this blackboard should be glowing, which it is actually, if you point a, if you point a infrared sensor at it, it is glowing, but the classical calculation said it should be going infinitely brightly, as should all of us, and that was off by a little bit. So that was the other little uh, dark cloud on the horizon, and that's the one that led to quantum mechanics. Which is, uh, so, uh, in fact, by 1900, Max Planck had already proposed that there was something, that some sort of weird patch was needed for the classical theory of electromagnetic radiation to explain why we're not all glowing infinitely brightly, that in some ways the radiation light behaved as if it uh, was lumpy rather than the traditional classical continuous waves. By 1905, Einstein had proposed taking this lumpiness more seriously as connected with more phenomena than uh, Planck had uh, initially uh, met. So that's 100 years ago. By, you know, 100 years ago, uh, quantum mechanics was starting to really be a theory of phenomena that was, people were starting to do calculations with. By 1912, uh, Peter Debye had found that this was not just some property of light, that sound also had the same strange lumpiness that was not at all present classically. By 1913, Bohr proposed that horrible little picture of the atom that you all see, which uh, is called quantum mechanics, but isn't. 
Um, but it has some quantum mechanical flavor to it. it. It shows some of the same lumpiness, and it's a step on the way toward quantum mechanics. One little special historical note for Illinois. By in 1921, Arthur Lund at the University of Chicago uh, invented quantum mechanics, as we know it now. That is, he invented the wave equation, he invented uh, the idea of treating particles as waves, he uh, uh, in found a wave equation for it, and he solved it, and he submitted the paper to uh, Physical Review, which was then is now the leading journal. It was rejected. So uh, he went and showed it only to his students, which included my dad. Um, and in 1923, uh, de Broglie waves were invented by de Broglie, uh, same as, same as Lund had done a couple years earlier. In 1925, Schrodinger uh, invented an equation uh, describing how these waves changed in time. That equation is going to be central to what we're going to talk about uh, in, at the end of uh, this talk. Uh, uh, the, again, the Schrodinger wave equation was also uh, Lund's equation. The this story of how Schrodinger came to invent that equation is interesting. Uh, de Broglie waves had been proposed, and uh, there was a discussion group talking about problems in physics, and uh, Debye turned to uh, Schrodinger and said, Schrodinger, we need a wave equation. You're not doing anything important these days. So that's how Schrodinger came to do it. So the point is, for 80 years, we've had quantum mechanics essentially in its modern form. And quantum mechanics now does not play the role of explaining a few little problems like stability of atoms or why blackboards don't glow, glow infinitely uh, brightly. Quantum mechanics is our entire theory of the microscopic world, atoms, everything. So you can't, there is no science of understanding things like uh, why current can go through easily through a copper wire but not through a sheet of Teflon, or why uh, any sort of chemical reaction occurs rather than some other chemical reaction. There's no science of that other than quantum mechanics. So it's, it's our whole picture of the microscopic world, not a fragmentary uh, account of a few problems. The history of it starts with a few outstanding problems, but that's not what it is now. Everything, uh, the, our transistors are, you know, we're surrounded by devices here that are quantum mechanical. Uh, well, the whole world is quantum mechanical, but ones whose invention required some knowledge of how quantum mechanics works. So we're talking about the basis of our understanding of all of microscop microscopic matter, and it, it's time perhaps to think a little bit about how to understand it. I want to try to present this from a modern point of view, that is not uh, focusing on some old historical hang-ups left over from 80 years ago when people were first starting to uh, appreciate this very strange world. So we're going to start in with some of the, with some of the phenomena, but we're not going to uh, try to get hung up on some of the old uh, issues that they're not worried about anymore. So let me start by presenting you with a quantum process, namely uh, counts of, let's see if I can get some volume on it. Yeah. This is just a, an ordinary Geiger counter. Some radioactive source is gradually falling apart. That is emitting particles by a quantum mechanical process. And you can hear it um, click, click away. You can see something keeping track of the counts. Anybody hear the pattern to that clicking? Listen carefully. Okay. How many hear the pattern? Oh, there's, there's a dozen people here who hear the pattern. Um, let's try it again. Is it the same pattern? There isn't any pattern. It's, uh, if, you, if you can hear the pattern, that's great. You know, you should work as a psychic for, uh, <laughs> um, so far as we know, there's, there's absolutely no pattern. It passes also a statistical test for being truly random. Uh, and so one of the first things you start wondering about is, uh, is this just totally indeterminate? Is there something causing the particular pattern of clicks? 
Uh, or is there nothing? Does it, do they just, is there a true randomness that comes out of nowhere? Now, this is uh, connected with the whole pro quantum mechanical problem of uh, uncertainty, quantum mechanical uncertainty. And I know you've all probably at some point heard a couple of uh, familiar sayings. Sometimes people say, Einstein showed that everything is relative. That is totally 100% wrong. He was very upset when people said that. Einstein never showed anything like that. Uh, among the many things he didn't show was relative or the speed of light, which he said was the same according to everybody. Um, the other thing that you often hear is people say, quantum mechanics shows that everything is uncertain, and then they'll draw sort of conclusions from that. Complete garbage, it's completely wrong. Uh, let me give you a little, one of countless examples uh, from quantum mechanics. When Planck in 1900 said, well, there's a lumpiness to light. There's a particular pattern to that lumpiness where the size of the energy lumps is proportional to the frequency of the light. This is, and the same proportionality constant for sound or for anything else that uh, you can measure. And there's, there's the proportionality constant. It's uh, 6.626.0755 joules uh, times uh, 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds with a little uncertainty on it. Does that sound like a theory that, you know, everything is completely uncertain, you can't say anything definite about anything? That's a kind of definite number. So quantum mechanics says extremely definite things about some things, but not about everything. It leaves some things open to be random, like those clicks you heard on the, uh, on the uh, Geiger counter. So here's the question that most of this talk will be about before we get into some really strange stuff at the end. And that is, are those clicks really occurring completely randomly? They sound random, but that doesn't prove anything. There's all sort of things that look random, uh, but aren't really. So this problem came up very early. The standard formulations of how to interpret quantum mechanics say that they, those events truly are random, but the, uh, a lot of the founders of quantum mechanics didn't like that. Uh, Einstein said, I don't believe God plays dice with the universe. And so that's really the question. Just because these things sound random, are they truly uncaused by anything in the prior universe, or do they just have hidden little causes that we have trouble keeping track of? Now, lots of things have little hidden causes that we have trouble keeping track of. Dice themselves, for example. If you're very skillful, you can roll dice and make them come out the way you want, because if your fingers are good and you're practiced, uh, you can control the little random positions of things that are actually making the dice come out one way or another. Let's look at an another sort of classical random, this should show up, I think, over there, classical random event. I'm gonna roll some uh, steel balls down through these uh, nails, and you'll see, yeah, good, we'll make it down. You'll see each ball bouncing off a bunch of nails, and you get a, a random pattern of where they arrive. When I drop these down here, I don't know which one's going to come out here, which one's going to come out here, which one's going to come out there. But if you look very carefully at each one, with a, maybe with a slow motion camera after the fact or something, or with a computer keep, keeping track very carefully, there are physical reasons for each ball to go the way it does. It depends on whether it hits this nail a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right. These ones that got stuck, well, if you look very closely at how they landed, you can figure out why those got stuck. So that's a type of classical randomness where it just says, hey, the causes are there on a small scale. It's hard for us to keep track of what the causes are. So to the best of our knowledge, we'll treat it as random. But we know for sure that there are real ordinary causes there. and. Uh, you know, imagine somebody throwing a, uh, throwing a knuckleball. They don't know where it's going to go. The catcher doesn't know where it's going to go. The catcher wears a big glove uh, because nobody knows. But it is determined by little currents in the air and by the exact pattern of the stitches on the ball. So it's just hard for anybody to keep track of that stuff. So that's one type of randomness. But we're talking here about a different type of randomness where we suspect that there are no little hidden causes. Einstein suspected that there were hid little hidden causes, as did de Broglie and, 
and uh, some other of the founders of quantum mechanics. Now, it might seem like that's something you could never really figure out. How can you tell whether something has a cause to make it come out the way it does or just happens to by some pure sort of metaphysical random chance? If the causes are hidden away enough, you might think there's no way to tell. But uh, it, many years after the founding of quantum mechanics, in 1964, John Bell figured out ways in which you could actually, without knowing anything in particular about what type of causes you were going to believe in, tell whether it was possible for some events to have anything like ordinary causes or not. And that's what we're going to talk about now. And that, this is sort of the logical core of what we're going to say. Now, I want to get away from talking about microscopic particles because when you start talking about microscopic particles, everybody gets this feeling, oh, it's a mystery, who knows what it is. Uh, I want to get the logic of this story across talking about things that are more familiar, that, are, they, they, that you can grasp with your uh, intuition. So I'm going to talk about people. We're used to people being a little bit mysterious, but not uh, mysterious in the way the quantum things are. So I'm going to tell you a little science fiction story about people. And it's going to sound really weird, but uh, just bear with me. And I want to make sure everybody gets the logic of it. Let's say you're a uh, food sociologist. And you've decided to tackle the important problem of why people like what they like on their pizza. OK? And uh, let's say you're interested in three questions. Why do they like pepperoni? Why do they like mushrooms? And why do they like olives? OK? And let's say, just to simplify the story, that you go start taking polls among the populace and you find that half of them like pepperoni, half of them like olives, and half of them like mushrooms, just, just to make the numbers simple. And then you, you look at these people and you try and figure out why, do they, why does one person like them, you know, olives, and, and another doesn't. And you look for all the standard things, social economic status, sex, race, you know, you name it. You go down the whole list and you say, no, I can't get it. Uh, you know, childhood, child rearing practice, whatever. Nothing seems to correlate with whether they like pepperoni. Um, this is, you know, a, a, a science fiction story. In the real world, probably something would. Um, does that justify you in saying that actually there is nothing in somebody's head that makes them say, I, I, give me pepperoni today, there are no causes? No, it doesn't. It just says you haven't found the causes. Uh, there might just be some subtle cause, some other property that you just didn't think of. So uh, how could you tell? Then somebody comes up with an idea, something like, uh, an idea that well, really uh, here ultimately goes back to Einstein, but which John Bell managed to develop further. Let's say that you find some couples. You find that the people are all grouped into couples. And let's imagine um, that this is the unrealistic world where these couples are all very amicable and like the same thing on their pizzas. In fact, Com completely, all of them do. My wife is laughing in particular. Um, <laughs> uh, so you take these, these couples and you ask them, do you like pepperoni? And they either both say yes or both say no. That makes it sound like it wasn't just some accident that occurred and happened for no reason in their head that cause them to give the answer they get. Otherwise, how would they always get their story straight? And they do the same thing with olives and uh, mushrooms. Um, now, these are limited people, it turns out. Uh, and this is going to be important to the rest of our story. They really aren't very cooperative, and they refuse to answer more than one question. Or they, each one of them is, is only willing to sort of coherently answer one question. So you're only allowed one question for each person. So now uh, you've decided that there must be something in their heads ahead of time 
that makes them give the answer that they give. In other words, there's a real cause, even though you have no idea what the cause is. Otherwise, there's no reason for the couples to always agree. Everybody agree on that point now, right? If they gave different answers, you'd be back saying there might be a reason, but, but you don't know what the reason is. So now let's see, our sociologist is going to try to uh, understand a little better about things. Maybe is whatever causes you to like pepperoni related to what causes you to like mushrooms? So they take a group of these couples, and even though they can only ask one question of each person, now they have these two couples, and they know that couples always agree on everything because they've done the test. They've asked couples about mushrooms. They've asked couples about pepper. So they know they always agree. So now you can just grab one member of each couple and uh, ask them about pepperoni and, and about mushrooms. And what you find is, hmm, whatever makes people like pepperoni also makes them like mushrooms. Because look, almost always when you get a no for pepperoni, you get a no for mushrooms. And almost always, you know, for yes, yeses are paired off with yeses. In fact, 85% of the time, you get the same answer. So that says that except for 15% of the people, if you like pepperoni, you like mushrooms. Now you do the same thing for onions and mushrooms, and you get the same result. Except for 15% of the people, if you like onions, you like mushrooms. Okay? And vice versa. Almost always, you grab the one member of the couple and ask you like onions, and the other one, uh, olives, sorry, olives. Uh, and ask the other, if you, do you like mushrooms? And they give the same answer. Not always, but 85% but of the time. Only 15% disagreement. Okay. So here is the key point where you, uh, we're going to use a, a, an instance of Bell's argument. And here's where there's a little logic, and I just want to spend as long on this one line of logic is needed to make sure everybody understands it. So now you ask people about pepperoni and olives. What can you get for the answer on pepperoni and olives? Well, look, you know that each one of those is almost in complete agreement with people's opinions on mushrooms, right? Only 15% disagreement. Let's say that the 15% who like mushrooms but not olives, for example, and like mushrooms but not pepperoni, if those happen to be the same 15%, then what agreement will we get on pepperoni and olives? We'll get 100%. We had a few people, you know, if it's the same, if we'll have the same opinion on each of those if it's the same 15% who disagree with the opinion on mushrooms. What if those two batches of 15% are completely different from each other? So here you've got a bunch of people with an opinion on mushrooms. 15% you peel off and say, no, they've got a different opinion about pepperoni than that. A completely different 15% you peel off and say they've got a different opinion about us than that. So now you've got a total of 30% disagreement between us. Those are the two extreme limiting cases, and you've got to be somewhere in between. Now you ask about pepperoni and olives, you have to have an agreement of somewhere, or a disagreement of somewhere between 0% and 30%. Any other is impossible. So now you go and ask them about pepperoni and olives, and what, let's see what you find, what our sociologist finds. They only give the same answer 50% of the time. It's completely crazy. It's completely illogical. It doesn't make any sense. The sociologist would never publish uh, if they want to keep their job, you know? It just, it just completely violates every principle of logic. Let's, let's look at that again, because I want to bring that home. Now we've got a list of, we've asked these one couple, member of the couple about olives, another about pepperoni, and we've got a list of answers. Those answers are only the same around 50% of the time. But we know that each of those lists, the pepperoni list and the olive list, has to agree with the mushroom list of answers 85% of the time. Try filling in a bunch of yeses and noes in there in some way that agrees 85% with that and 85% with that. You can't do it because these are 50% in disagreement with each other. 
the best you could do with some list in here is 75% uh, agreement with that and 75% agreement with that. You can't get to 85%. Okay, so I think people understand the logic of that. I hope they understand the logic of it. And that's, that's why this is such a stupid science fiction story. Well, you start thinking later. People, maybe they're cheating, or maybe it's statistics. You know, anything can happen with statistics if you have a small sample. You just got unlucky, some weird coincidence. So you make a, get a big grant, you make a huge study, 100,000 people, but the results look just the same. So it wasn't statistics. Then you realize, okay, people can be sneaky. Maybe they had cell phones and were somehow communicating with each other, saying, I just said, I'll, you know, I like olives, you say the same thing, you know, that sort of stuff. So you separate the couples and, and little boxes or something, and it doesn't make any difference. Then you try, you synchronize your watches with your experimental partner. You make sure you ask the question at exactly the same time. So even if they had, you know, ultra secret, super duper cell phones that could go through copper, there's no time for signals to go back and forth. Signals travel at the speed of light. Doesn't make any difference. They still keep their story straight. Then you say, wait a moment. Maybe they only get their story straight on the questions that they're actually going to be asked. There's no, they don't have a list of answers that they would have given on the questions they're not going to be asked. In other words, it's like an animal house. Somebody went into the dumpster and found the exam ahead of time. Um, and so that's the only thing that they've got their, uh, their questions straight on. He says, I won't let them do that. Instead of planning out ahead which questions I'm going to ask which couples, I'll randomly, me and my partner will randomly draw questions out of a hat. So they don't even have any time. There's no, way, there's no way they can even know what they're going to be asked. It doesn't make any difference. So this is just getting, you know, all of our attempted excuses are completely unsuccessful. We end up with the uh, conclusion that this list of numbers is only 15% different from that list of numbers, and this list is only 15% different from that, yet somehow this is 50% different from that. That's impossible. You can't have these 50% different without these adding up to 50%. It's like the triangle inequality in geometry. So that's, these lists exist because whenever you ask these questions of people, in pairs, they give the same answer. So how could there not be a list ahead of time of what those answers would be? It, uh, it, that's why we end up concluding this is science fiction. But now let's go through and uh, do the same sort of, uh, ask the same question about something other than people's pizza preferences. We'll make an, a little experiment where there's something that emits particle pairs that go out here and get some sort of measurements done on them. And we have a choice of several uh, different types of measurement. We can measure whether the particle goes through a polarizer that looks like this, whether it goes through a polarizer that looks like this, or a polarizer that looks like that. We can do the same thing over here. And so for each particle, we either get a yes or no, it made it through the polarizer or it didn't, depending on which of the three questions we asked. This one plays the role of olives, this one of mushroom. Okay. So lo the logical structure, and the, here's, the, here's the couple. So the logical structure we're doing with these particles is exactly the same as what we do. We have a bunch of couples, a long string of them. We have three, a choice of three questions we can ask each of them. We can govern which question we ask them by some little random number generator there. We don't have to make a list ahead of time of what we're going to ask them. And the story is exactly what I told you. Just translate the words like pepperoni into, you know, physical words, polarized vertically. Translate the words like mushrooms into polarized at this little 22 and a half degree angle here. And translate the words like olives into polarized at the 45 degree angle. And even if you don't know quite what those things mean, we've outlined the, the logic of what happens. And the science fiction story I told you is exactly what happens. We come out, whenever we ask the two couple members of these particles, are you polarized along this direction? We ask them about the same direction. They always give the same answer. So that tells us 
wait a moment, they must have known ahead of time. They couldn't, it couldn't just be some completely random thing that happens here with no prior cause, otherwise how would this one know to come out exactly the same? And we get that every time we ask for any one of these questions. But then we start doing pairs of different questions, and we get that these two pairs almost always agree, these two pairs almost always agree, but these two pairs disagree half the time. It just can't be that way. You and I can't almost always agree, and you two almost always agree, and yet we disagree 50% of the time. It just doesn't add up mathematically. So uh, something is completely crazy here. And uh, I'm not making any of this. This is uh, real results. I don't know if Paul Quiat is, uh, yeah, there's Paul Quiat. Paul Quiat does essentially this experiment. I think that's fair to say. Uh, routinely in this building, unfortunately, the apparatus is a little delicate, so we couldn't bring it down here. Uh, but he can get this experiment to work with incredible statistical accuracy in a few seconds, and the results are just what we just pairs are pairs of photons, little blips of light. So, yet we, when we talked about the level where we have intuition, high scale of people, we concluded this has to be fiction. What did we assume when we came to that conclusion? Let's try to sort of unpack what we were assuming about reality. Because something we assumed about reality is false, because we came to a false conclusion. First of all, we didn't assume anything at all about quantum mechanics. When I told that story, I never mentioned quantum mechanics. The logic of it has nothing to do about quantum mechanics. And Paul would never have done his experiments if he hadn't heard of quantum mechanics, but if by accident he had, for some other reason, the results are the results. There are a bunch of clicks on detectors. And those clicks on detectors violate logic, or our assumptions, in exactly the way I described whether or not you'd ever heard about quantum mechanics. So we, we're not going to get away with saying, oh, well, you know, there's something funny about quantum theory. There is, but, but that's not what we're uh, after right now. We're after what's wrong about our assumptions about the world. Implicitly, there's different ways people describe this, but one, one of the things we assumed was realism. We did not assume with Einstein that you can't have things that are purely random. We said maybe there are things that are purely random, maybe there aren't. But if you can tell exactly what's going to happen by some remote measurement that doesn't affect it, then we're saying that thing had a, had a cause. If I know which way the ball is going to bounce in each of these things, and can tell you that by looking, then there's a cause to how that happens. So that uh, sometimes goes by the name of realism. Uh, the a description of it was nicely written by Einstein and uh, his collaborators. Just saying the things, you, the things that you can predict with certainty have actual real causes. Second, we assume that the causes are local. That is, they occur someplace in space and time. That you can't have some sort of cause which is smeared out all over space and makes both this guy go this way and that one go that way, uh, that whatever makes this thing result come out the way it does is some, somehow where that event is happening. That's called locality. Uh, and that things can't transmit signals in, infinitely fast from one place to another. And finally, we assume that there was no uh, conspiracy that nobody had somehow passed out choreography cards to all the little particles ahead of time to tell them uh, you're just, you know, including our random number generators that are, that are deciding which particular measurements are made here, saying you're going to measure 22 and a half degrees, you're going to measure at 45 degrees, and you're going to come out, you know, saying yes, you went through that, and you're going to go just, you know, the, the major mission and just entirely playing a dance with these things to uh, just drive us nuts by doing things that look impossible. So that's another assumption, that there's no just purely malicious uh, conspiracy of nature to do insane things. And that's it. These are the only assumptions that went into it. So what we know is that if you combine those three assumptions, you end up with implications that uh, are false. Therefore, one, at least one of those three assumptions is false. And so we could take a vote. We got three choices. You have to vote, and the point is you have to vote for at least one. You could vote for two or three if you're really, you know, in that mood, but uh, 
How many want to give up realism as, as defined by Einstein? Okay, a, a few votes for giving up realism. How many want to uh, give up locality? The idea that think quite a number of votes for locality. And how many want to give up the no and some it's always Yeah, it was coming, yeah. Uh, I, my personal vote, and I think it's probably the most popular one among physicists these days, is to give up strict locality. But, you know, it's a vote, it's not science exactly. <laughs> so, uh, and by the way, giving up locality in that way doesn't quite violate the rules on which special relativity is based. Because it turns out you can't send a signal from one place to another using these uh, uh, random events. If you send a signal, it would be like a purely random uh, telegraph where what comes out at, at one end has nothing to do with, well, nothing goes into the telegraph. Actually, there's a funny story about that. Uh, because it looks like these events violate locality, meaning that it's as if signals could travel faster than the speed of light, the Stanford um, Research Institute proposed to the Navy at one point, why don't, we, uh, why don't we build a device using this to send signals backwards in time? They said it's very important because you don't want to start a nuclear war because you think something's coming in, but you never want to, but you want, you want to be the first to shoot if, uh, you know, because you want to knock out the other guy's silos, they, they were saying. So uh, what you want to do is, if you decide you're being attacked, you want to send a signal to yourself uh, in the past so that you launch first. Um, they asked for a few million dollars for this, and the Navy uh, was smart enough actually to turn them down. So, <laughs> uh, because the fact is, the signal you would be sending to yourself in the past is a completely random bunch of those yes, no's. It has no pattern to it. And if anybody thought they heard a pattern to it and launched a nuclear war, it would be about like the number of you who thought you heard a pattern in the Geiger counter, only with worse consequences. Um, OK. So that's all I want to say about Bell's inequality and the failure of local realism. The ground rules for quantum mechanics are weird. They're, they're just, we're not going to be able to somehow say, oh, it's really a bunch of little things bouncing around in a way that uh, ultimately we can picture as gears and wheels or some sort of classical picture. It's, it's really different from that. So that's probably enough intellectually to absorb in one day, but I want to say a few words about something else. Where does the randomness come from? In the theory, where does the randomness enter? Again, I think there's uh, popular misconceptions about that, where you say that somehow things are random on a small scale. Actually, that, I'm sorry, I've got one equation here, and it looks weird, but I'm going to give you a qualitative description of what it's trying to tell you. Uh, let's go back to the core of quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation. What does it do? It says, you represent a physical system by some quantum state. And that quantum state changes in time. The same as if you said where a bunch of billiard ball balls are in a classical description, they change in time. Classically, you have a description of how those time changes occur. If you say where the billiard balls are and how they're moving and what their masses are and so on, then if you apply Newton's laws, which work pretty well on that scale, you can say exactly how they're going to bounce around in the future. Quantum mechanics has precisely something analogous. It's a Schrodinger equation, and let me just try to give you a feel of what the equation says. It says, you quantum state now, and I can tell you how it changes in time, this is how it's changing in time, by taking some function of the quantum state. This says, take a function of the quantum state. In other words, it's just analogous to Newton. You tell me what's what it is now, and I know the rules of the game, namely that function, and I'll tell you exactly how it's going to change in time. So there's just two points I want you to get about that. And there's not that there's an imaginary number in it and that, you, that it's often written with a Greek letter or something like that. It's this. The two points are this. One is that that equation is completely deterministic. 
It doesn't say if, maybe, this might. It says, you give me this state, there's rules of the game, and the state will change in exactly this way. There is no chance whatever in it. There's no more chance in it than there is in any of Newton's laws. So it's not where the randomness is coming from. And the second point about this is that it's uh, linear. So this is the one, other than the one, this is really the one uh, semi-mathematical point I want to make. What linear equations have a, a, a property, which is that if you take any two solutions and add them together, they're also a solution to that equation. Let me give you an example with the class, classical waves. Let's look at uh, classical water waves, which are uh, described pretty well by linear equation. So you can see, I can start a little water wave, and you see the nice circular pattern traveling out from the source. I can do it also with my left hand. Pretty amazing. Um, but I can also do two of them at once. And what you see, obviously you can't check it very carefully mathematically, but what you see is that those waves, although they have a period where they overlap some, actually, yeah, that, when I start them farther apart, you can see it better. They travel out, and you see a wave pattern going out here where another one goes off that way, completely independent of each other. What that says is that the wave pattern from one of these little sources, those nice circularly spreading waves, was a solution to this particular wave equation. So was the wave pattern from the other source. And now when I put them together, I don't have to do anything tricky. The solution is just the sum of those two solutions, just the combination of those two waves. That's linearity. If you take solution A and solution B and make some sort of combination of them, it's also a solution to the same equation. OK. Ten minutes? Oh. All right. Um, so let's, again, these, these are, look like uh, equations, but I'm really just going to talk about them. You don't have to worry about the equation. Uh, let's say you do an experiment which is a sort of sadistic Schrodinger version of uh, something that he talked about in a, on a walk with Einstein. Let's say that you make a quantum apparatus that will either kill a cat or give it some food depending on what the outcome of this uh, quantum experiment is. For example, it might be something that opens a little uh, electronic gate for a second, and if there's a Geiger click, kills the cat, and if there's not a Geiger click, doesn't kill the cat. Okay? You can prepare an initial state which is certain to, uh, this stands for a, a sta an initial state of the quantum system that takes the quantum state of the cat and leaves it alive. L is for live. Or initial state, which happens to be the one which takes the quantum state of the cat and kills it, leaves a dead cat. So this could be one of those little polarizers where uh, you prepare a photon that's polarized this way. If it goes through here, it triggers the apparatus that lets the cat live. Or you can prepare one that's polarized this way. It doesn't go through here, and the cat gets killed. So you can prepare either of those states and make sure that what you think is the solution of the uh, Schrodinger equation is right. Now, this may surprise you. I'm giving quantum states of cats, not electrons here. But those cats are made out of protons, all quantum particles. But there's some other ingredient to the universe that's not contained in quantum mechanics. We should be able to give quantum state of everything, just the combined quantum state of all the parts. So if, and we never found anything that looks like it wasn't made out of quantum mechanical parts. So now let's do something else. Let's take this cat, put it in the apparatus, and instead of preparing something that's polarized this way or polarized this way, we prepare something that's polarized in between, which means it's of the quantum state that would give you a live cat and some of the quantum state that would give you a dead cat. Okay? 
trivial thing to do in the lab. This is not, you know, this is not science fiction. Anybody could do this with, with simple apparatus. And a cat, yeah. Well, let's not use a cat. Let's use a cockroach. But um, <laughs> everybody's heard of Schrodinger's cat. So that's, we use that for the story. We sneak in a cockroach, maybe we'll put whiskers on it or something for the real. Um, so we prepared the quantum state that's uh, got a little bit of each, the thing that will lead to a live cat and the thing that will lead to a dead cat. And now we use linearity. We don't use any of the details of this equation. We just use that Schrodinger's equation is absolutely strictly linear, which tells you that what comes out when you combine two solution, you know, two initial starting things is just the sum of what would come out from one of them plus what will come out from the other one. Remember we said that a combined, if you take two, two waves starting off, what comes out is just the sum of what would have come out of them separately. That's what linearity of an equation means. You add a little, two little starting pieces, what comes out is the ending state is just the sum of the two ending states. Which means that the state that comes out following Schrodinger equation is this funny combination of a live cat and a dead cat. Okay? That's why people talk about Schrodinger's cat. It behaves differently from ones you're familiar with. Um, so how often, let me just clarify what that means when we say live cat plus dead cat in the solution. I don't mean a zombie cat or a cat that's, you know, kind of sluggish or something like that. I mean that the cat is both alive and munching its food and, you know, dead and rotting away. How often have you seen that? Presumably, uh, with possible exception of those of you who heard the pattern in the, um, in the Geiger counter, um, <laughs> Uh, you, you haven't seen very many live dead cats. Every cat is either alive or dead. I mean, you can see one in, in transition, but not, you, you never see something like this. So what are we going to do about that? What we see isn't, what's in the, isn't what comes out of the only equation we have to describe things. Yes? Well, yeah, that's a very good question. The apparatus should be. Uh, well, the apparatus presumably has a quantum state as well. In fact, let's go right past the apparatus because ultimately what we're talking about is you, what you see. You know, uh, that's all we can really discuss is what we actually observe. So let's include you with the Y. Now, this may be a little bit of a shock, but as so far as we know, you're made up out of electrons and protons and neutrons and stuff too, all these little quantum pieces, which means that you also have a quantum state, which will denote Y for you. And we know that if we set up this apparatus so that the cat lived, you would end up in, a, in the state which saw a live cat, which we'll call Y sub L, you see live cat. The other possibility is that you set the apparatus in a state that you see live. Uh, uh, that kills the cat, so you see dead. Okay? Or we could do what we just talked about, and it doesn't quite fit on the page here, but, uh, where we set up the apparatus in a combination of the we set up the initial quantum state in a combination of the thing that led to a live cat and a dead cat. And what that leads to is a, a quantum state that contains a combination of uh, the live cat and the U which sees the dead cat. Now, you've never experienced a U that's a combination like that. So what this says is that if the Schrodinger equation is correct, and it works beautifully, it gives some things correct to say one part in 10 to the 10th. If the Schrodinger equation is actually correct, and if for some reason or other, there is no such thing as a you experiencing both seeing the live cat and seeing the dead cat, 
since the final quantum state here has both those pieces in it, they must split apart and somehow be experienced separately. So we started with one U in this experiment, and we ended with two different U's. One of, you, one of which sees the live cat and one of which sees the dead cat. And we didn't make that up because we like science fiction stories. We made it up because we like equations and we have one that works beautifully. And we just looked at the necessary implication of that equation being right. So this is uh, what's called the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. It says, if Asian is right. And we have got a couple different uses coming out of here. Uh, as they say in Brooklyn, which of use guys is real? Uh, as far as the equation is concerned, both use guys is real. And so we say, okay, well, the equation says so. Uh, and it says that every time any sort of quantum event occurs that could have different outcomes, all the outcomes occur. That's, what's, again, what's called the many worlds interpretation of uh, quantum mechanics. And obviously, it's somewhat offensive to intuition, uh, it's, it's, at least initially. So it's, it, although it's believed by a majority of practitioners of some areas of physics, cosmologists, for example, it's probably not overall accepted as, as the proper interpretation of quantum mechanics. So let me give you now uh, just a really quick sketch of what the different interpretations of quantum mechanics are. And this is, but it probably doesn't matter how far I go down a list of bad interpretations because they're all bad. The oldest interpretation is the one due to de Broglie and Einstein, which is, oh, maybe there's some little hidden variables that really determine how these random things come out. And we've seen by a very rigorous argument that if, if there are, those variables are not hidden in any particular place in space and time. They're not moving around. So that, that, out, that type of interpretation has kind of lost its appeal. The sort of daily version that most of us work with is the idea, oh, somehow one of those branches of the quantum state that comes out of the Schrodinger equation goes away, or that is all except one of the branches somehow disappear at some point. And we don't quite say how it happens, and we don't like to think about it, and we can use the theory without discussing it. But that's obviously not entirely satisfactory to say, we have a, a beautiful, perfect equation, then it quits working. We don't know quite when, but you know, then onward, we'll use the equation again. That's not a very uh, satisfactory interpretation. There's, when, when physicists get on their high horse and start talking formally, uh, they start saying, oh, that quantum state was never real. Um, it was just a calculating tool. But that doesn't really help understand why, unlike all the other representations we ever have of physical states, that's less real than any. Some people say, well, the Schrodinger equation is wrong. The, the quantum state does collapse, and we just need a, a, a fancier equation that's not linear to show how that process occurs. Uh, that sounds appealing. It does lead to very ugly attempts at equations where you start basically having to throw the kitchen sink into the equation, too, to get it to behave the way it does. There are popular accounts would say, oh, it's all in the you. It's all in the mind. Something about your mind is outside the realm of physics. And that's what causes the quantum state to collapse. And there, I asked an advocate of this uh, view, at what point in the last three and a half billion years or so, uh, that his answer has become sufficiently uh, outside the physical realm to cause the quantum state to collapse. And he said something to the effect of it was around when he was in graduate school. But uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, I think this is the cold interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, and then there's the uh, many worlds interpretation, which just says, well, listen to the equation. Uh, it says that all the different outcomes uh, occur. Let's say for a minute that you like equations, you are not too worried about your ego, and you're prepared to accept that, even though it sounds crazy. I just want to conclude by saying it's not crazy enough. Uh, let's say that you do Schrodinger's equation, 
sadistic experiment many times, but you decide to be nice. You prepare the quantum state initially, not sort of halfway in between the one that gives a live cat and the one that gives a dead cat. You decide, I'll just give them a little edge. I'll make it so that it's, uh, most of it, two thirds of it is lined up along the quantum state that gives a live cat and only one third along the quantum state that gives a dead cat. Now we know experimentally what comes out of that. If you do this experiment many times, two thirds of the cats are alive. Yeah. Um, so in that case, we know experimentally that we get two thirds alive and one third dead. But if you ask how many worlds are there, how many versions of you see each, see each of these, each time you do it, there's one version of you that sees a live cat and one version that sees a dead cat. So the vast majority of the versions of you at the end of the, many of these experiments would see half live and half dead. That type of random as opposed to this type of random. And that's not what we see. So we need some other excuse for why the worlds that have sort of more of the quantum state on them somehow end up counting more, being seen more often than an equally good world that just has a little less of the quantum state on it. And so uh, I have my own particular eccentric view um, that maybe we need more worlds where the big ones, are, they're all splitting even more into sub-worlds and the big ones split more than the little ones so that the count of the numbers of them come out right. Uh, that's a totally eccentric view and nobody's expected to believe it, even if you believed everything up to that point. But um, maybe this is a good point to stop, and, and, and I hope we have some real discussion. Um, yes, the question was whether you could somehow make things that look non-local come out local if you consider higher dimensional connections. Um, maybe. Uh, nobody has successfully done that. Um, Stephen Wolfram claimed in his book that uh, he could derive that, that, or that he could show that that's how it all worked, but he never actually did show that. And he cl had claimed on another page that in fact, he could derive, you have the ordinary space-time where there are no so, such hidden connections from his equation. So the, the answer is, is maybe, but, but it's never been done, and, and uh, it's not clear how it would be done. Good question. Laura. Laura. Right. Short time scale, there's no half life. Right. If you have to spend your half life, it's ten years. You have you start with a grand, you're exaggerating half a grand left. And in ten more years you're exaggerating a quarter of a grand. Right. And I can't get behind that with these men. Well, uh, the word exactly isn't quite exact. You have <laughs> you have um, you have exactly within statistical fluctuations. So if you have um, say uh, two hundred million raw particles and you wait one half-life, you have about 100 million, but with a little statistical fluctuations of that around, you know, plus or minus 10,000. Okay, so let's take 10 to the 24th. Okay. And after half, after one lifetime, you have about five times 10 to the 23rd. But that's plus or minus about 10 to the 12th. There's a little statistical uncertainty. It's just a chance, it's a chance process and like any chance process, uh, if you have big numbers, you can predict the average values pretty well, but not perfectly. There will be just, but in that way, it's not different from classical chance. We'd get the same thing if we were flipping coins. So uh, the statistical properties of it look just like classical chance that way. Yes? Yeah. 
That's basically it, yes. Uh, uh, the question was, um, what's the connection between this polarized light experiment and the double slit experiment, which some of you may have heard of, where uh, a particle, a buckyball, light particle, and all sorts of different things, goes through a pair of slits and then arrives somewhere. Somehow when it arrives, it arrives at a particular place, but you can show from the interference pattern, not quite with the rigor of Bell, but with interference pattern plus some common sense, that when it went through the two holes, it actually went through both of them. It didn't choose this one or that one. Um, it's very similar to that. Here, you show that it arrives with some polarization, but because of the funny connections with the other guy, we've shown that it didn't know that polarization ahead of time. If, it knew, if those polarizations were known ahead of time, then you would have obey Bell's inequality and have the logical connections between this guy's polarizations and that one's. Since those logical connections are not there, it didn't really know the polarization at all. It just somehow just happened. The same way that the position of that particle just sort of happens. It wasn't determined. It wasn't there ahead of time. So, the, yeah, there's a very close, those are just two aspects of the same type of thing where an actual spread of possibilities in quantum mechanics, so they all have to be there somehow collapse to one experienced reality where something shows up here or here or gets polarized this way or that way. And that collapse process is the so-called measurement problem in quantum mechanics. We, that's the part where I gave the list of crazy ideas. Uh, there are no good ideas for it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, John raises the, the question, uh, maybe logic itself is inadequate. That is, the entire logic that we've used for, well, parts of it for thousands of years um, is somehow wrong. Something, our memories are not so good. You said 15 or 20 years ago. Maybe 40 or <laughs> years ago, there was a popular movement of something called not that popular, I mean, it wasn't like rock music or something, um, but uh, uh, called quantum logic, which was that maybe quantum mechanics is telling us that traditional logic is wrong in the same way that general relativity tells us that traditional geometry of space-time is wrong. And basically, that idea has flopped. It just, it just didn't succeed in addressing any of the key questions of, uh, so for example, Hilary Putnam, who was one of the wrote a beautiful essay saying, making this analogy with general relativity, uh, now says, well, that analogy could have been right, but in fact, it didn't solve any of the problems. So he's, he's now into uh, various uh, violations of Schrodinger equation. Okay, the, the question was when, uh, let's say that of the th things that might be violated, it's locality. When locality is violated, uh, do we have any idea of what the mechanics are behind that? And the, the answer is we're basically sure that there are no mechanics behind it because if there were mechanics behind it, then it would have to obey more normal logic. The other part of your question is, well, is there somehow a connection is related to your question? Well, maybe in some other dimension, these things are really close together. Um, I can't say for absolute sure that that's wrong, but like, there's no uh, theory that makes sense of, of, of that. Yeah. Uh, 